all right guys i just hope you all are able to see my screen see the video and i'm also audible i'll just need a confirmation from your end okay thank you so much thanks for the confirmation okay so we'll begin today's session so as you all know that in the session today we are going to first discuss for the reset batch that why the students fail right why the students fails and fail in fr the common mistakes that you all are making after that we will drill the questions from single entity the 20 mark session sequence questions okay so both the sessions are useful for both the type of students now if you've just come for the reset orientation the initial 30 minutes are very crucial for you but after 30 minutes i'll start drilling the 20 mark questions on single entity again that's useful for you and my regular students my regular students who are here to drill the single entity questions again the first 30 minutes are useful for you because in this i am discussing the common mistakes because of which students tend to fail okay so now i officially welcome you all for the post result batch of march 2024 from wifi okay now let me just give a brief introduction of myself so my name is aisha faisal as most of you all already know i am a ecc and cpa canada member Okay, I've been in the teaching industry for more than 10 years and specifically ACCA teaching is something that I've been doing consistently every quarter for past five years. Okay, I've got the opportunity to teach more than 2,500 students and in, the, in these 2,500 students, I've happened to have many rankers as well. Okay, currently I am tied up with KPMG and in the past I've also happened to work with one of the top CA firms in India. Okay, now jumping straight to the problem, attacking straight the problem, I don't want to waste your time more, that why is it that in this quarter, the FR exam that you all have attempted, there was a pass percentage of 50. So why out of 10 students, why out of 10 students, we see a pattern of five students passing and five students failing? Why is this pattern there? How can the student who is failing turn his fail into a pass? How can he go and enter the other group? Okay, this is something very important because failing means wasting one quarter, one quarter, good three months of your life. Why would we want to do that? We would want to accelerate our ACCA membership, finish our education and enter the corporate field super early, right? So yes, it's important to, to know that you should not repeat those errors. You should not repeat those mistakes and fail the second time. And if this is your first time, then try that. Let's not fail the first time as well. See, just in case you fail, I don't want you to be demotivated at all because don't think that failing is a stigma or is a taboo. No, not at all. In your journey of ACCA professional course and any other professional course or any other real life also course, um, you are going to fail so many times. And the idea is if you are failing, how are you helping yourself get up again? Because if you don't learn this attitude of failing and getting up again, then trust me, uh, you might not be able to cope up in the real world issues, the corporate issues. Because in the corporate world, there are so many times that when we try to do the problem solving, when, when we try to work on the projects, it is not every time that we're able to hit the bullseye. So many times you're not able to, you know, uh, deliver the uh, piecemeal of that project or whatever it is. We need guidance from our superiors. It is then we try to analyze what mistake we have done. Then we try to rise again and then we try to, uh, you know, achieve the target again. Now, this attitude of failing and then rising up again is only possible if in your professional exam course, you have already passed through this journey. So like I said, don't get demotivated. This is a very important attitude of failing and rising up again. If you learn this now, it's really, really going to be beneficial for you in the real world. Idea is, idea is you are not doing justice to yourself. If after you fail, you're not trying to cover up the gap, you're not trying to analyze or assess what wrong you have done. And then basis that you're not trying to devise a proper plan and strategy for the next 40 days before your exam. That's when you go wrong. You don't go wrong when you fail, but that's when you go wrong, that when you don't learn from your mistake. Okay. So what is it that in preparation we should not do as a mistake? Okay. What is it that we should not 
do what are the wrong things we should not do while we are preparing okay and second i will also discuss things which we should not be doing during our exams both the things are very important now you have 40 days before the exam okay you have 40 days before the exam your exam is on 4th of march in our planners, yes, I'm aware that 7th of March is written because our earlier pattern from so many years, like from so many years, it's been always uh, 7th, right? So this is the first time that it is uh, changed and it's 4th of March. So I have to change it still on the planner. Don't worry, I'll make that change. Now, yeah. <clears throat> Why, uh, what are the things that we are not supposed to repeat as a mistake in the preparation phase? What we are doing is, what we are doing is, we are not practicing enough material on CBET platform. We are not practicing enough material on CBET platform. You all know that this is not a pen and paper exam. Unfortunately, there are students who still tend to practice the questions, the section A, B or C on a pen and paper. Because that's what they're used to probably from secondary school, from their uh, college time. That is why they're so used to it that after entering this professional course of ACC also, they're using your their pen and paper. Understand that your exam is a computer-based exam. If you don't get used to the computer-based platform typing on keyboard very fast, then even if you're very good with the knowledge, even if you, it's at the back of your head, all the content is at the back of your head. At exam day, you'll become nervous. You will struggle to type and put what is in your head on the keyboard. You will struggle. Okay, you will struggle. Okay, it's as good as I'm telling someone to, uh, you know, uh, give a, uh, you know, you have to do a speaking test, but it's always that you have just thought of what you have to speak and you've never practiced speaking at all. How do you then do the speaking test on the exam day? That's not possible, right? So if this practice or this material uh, practice practice is done on a pen and paper, and if you're just very good in the con with the concepts in your head, if you've not practiced this on the CBET platform, um, there is a next to impossible chance that you might pass the paper, right? So yes, CBET pl practice platform is very necessary for your section C type, okay, for your section C type. Now, your section A and B type, what is the mistake that we are doing in section A and B type? Section A and B type, if you practice it a lot on Excel, it's a problem. When I am demonstrating in the class section A and B type, I will use Excel because those sheets have to be preserved. Second, you have to see the calculation that I am doing. Okay, is why I will use Excel. But you as a student, when you're practicing, section A and B type should not be practiced on Excel, but a blank space. And calculation should happen on calculator. If you have not practiced using your calculator for section A and B type, again, you will struggle in the exam. This is the feedback from five years that I have from students who have told me that they have practiced section A and B type so much on Excel sheet that when they went to do the exam, they struggled because there was no Excel for section A and B. This you all should be aware. There is no Excel for section A and B. There is no spreadsheet for section A and B. So they were not used to doing these calculations on calculator. This is why they struggled. And understand that there are so many students when they fail, majority of the student fail with marks like 49, 48, 47. This is the common bracket, meaning students fail with either three marks or less than that. Most of the students, most majority of the students are failing with three marks or lesser than that. So this journey of three marks is very crucial. These all small, small tips will turn your fail into pass. Okay, will turn your fail into pass. So yes, practicing section A and B type on a blank word space and using calculator is very crucial. Now, in your preparation phase, what is the next problem is that you all are not covering the whole syllabus. You all have a cherry picking strategy. Either you all like consolidation, so you all drill too much of consolidation and leave single entity and ratios, or you all do single entity and don't do consolidation ratios. Either you all do a cherry picking. Understand that ratios is very crucial. It's a compulsory question. Every paper has it. So you can't by any means leave ratio. Ratio is a lot of... Um, creative writing okay so there some students struggle because it's creative writing now even if it's creative writing there is a strategy to go about it so there's no way that you should be skipping this okay second consolidation and single entity you can't cherry pick because there's no option given to you it's not that consolidation and single entity both will come and you have to choose no 
either one will come 50% probability either one is going to come 50% probability so there's no way that we can cherry pick okay again when short short standards are tested in section a and b sometimes the paper gets dominated by one topic like ifrs5 or non current assets held for sale could dominate the paper like good 10 mark could be tested in section a and b on that or good 15 mark could get tested on that on that or intangible assets so that way when students ask me which is the most um, you know um, which is the topic which will carry the most high marks in section a and b there's no way we can give you know the strategy there's no past university papers where we can see this pattern is there no the your paper could get dominated by any set of section uh, any set of mcqs now we don't know what that topic could be right we don't know what that topic could be so don't be cherry pick don't leave any topic covering the whole paper whole syllabus is very crucial okay now second you all are not planning your time now we know that our target is covering whole syllabus we know we have to drill enough consolidation single entity and ratios but we don't have a plan to do it of course it's intimidating we have so much of syllabus to cover but we don't have a plan it's intimidating and then you procrastinate you keep thinking that okay you will do it the next day next day next day until the next day next day next day your 50 days shrinks shrinks to 40 40 to 30 20 10 and then we just we have no days left for the exam and then we are just left with panicking so to plan your time wisely is very important okay lastly you all don't have access to keynotes for quick revision all the time so if my regular students would know that I am making the bird eye notes or cheat sheets, right? Where one standard is there just on one page. Or if it's a very long standard, then it might go to two pages. In SBR, very rare standard will go to a three pager also. But that's very rare. Mostly all standards are there, like a bird eye view, just on one page. So that's a very good summary because for you to crack a sum, those notes are just on one page. Now you're traveling, you're doing whatever. Either that is as a PDF one page note on your phone, a snapshot, or if you're like physical papers, you like to do a lot of markings and all, it's just as a one page in your bag. How easy to carry anywhere, how easy to even stick and retain at your home anywhere. So this way, the concepts gets engraved in your head with very little effort till exam date. Now in exam, when you want to crack the sum, the theory is already, the theory or how to crack it is already engraved in your head because of the cheat sheet, because of that one bird eye view note. Okay, it's already engraved in your head. So yes, not having to quick keynotes for revision all the time becomes a problem. So this is something very es essential that you all should have. Now, if you all don't join the research session, you all don't join the research session, uh, you might not have access to my bird eye view notes. That's fine. But I'd suggest prepare your own bird eye view notes. When you're done with listening to a lecture, when you're done with what are the keynotes that you have to make, when you do this in your physical book or on your spreadsheet, wherever you're making your notes, turn all those notes into just one page. Okay, just one page summary. That's very important. Even if you don't have access to mine, you will have to make for your own self this. For any exam, this is very crucial. This gets gives you control over the whole syllabus in just few pages. Control over the whole syllabus in just few pages. Okay. So yes, for preparation, these are some very important things that we all have to remember. Okay, now some things that y'all are doing during exams, which y'all probably shouldn't be doing. Yeah, what is that? Now, one thing, the whole paper y'all are not attempting. The whole paper is not attempted. That's a problem. Because what will happen is mostly when you finish the entire paper, your script gets marked in such a manner that it's a fully attempted script. Okay, it's a fully attempted script. That kind of marking it will get. Now, always a fully attempted script will have a better chance of passing compared to an incomplete script. So, because there's no negative marking, there's no negative marking con concept in ACCA, it is not making sense for us to leave any question blank. Okay? So, for every question, there is something that you have to write. Okay? I'm not talking about writing perfect answers. I'm not writing, I'm not saying that you have to get the final correct answer. So stick to that question till you don't get the correct answer. This is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you have to attempt. Attempt is what I'm asking. Okay. That's it. That's the bare minimum that you have to do with a question. If you don't know. Okay. Of course, the questions you know, you're going to give quality answer, but the question you don't know, there's no quality answer you can give. The least you can do is that you can recall what standard it could be related to, recall the requirements of the standard, attempt it and quickly move on from there. You're going to lose the mark there, right? So don't invest a lot of time, quickly move on from there. Next, leaving questions in continuity. Now, this is a problem because here you lose the marks which are of OFR rule. Now, what is this rule? Okay. Very less people know about this rule. 
what are we doing now what is happening in a uh, 20 mark questions your section c questions there's a problem that you all are doing say for example if one question is asking you to draft a profit and loss statement which is a good 15 mark question for example and then requirement b is a five mark for eps earnings per share okay so in your pnl you'll get a profit for the year figure now in requirement b when you're calculating eps you are going to use the same profit figure to calculate your eps what's the problem here students think that okay of course they've drafted a pnl and there were so many unique adjustments coming not many but of course one or two unique adjustments is what you will see and it's natural that none of you all are going to attempt the 15 mark question in such a manner that you all are going to get full 15 mark right you all will be close to 12 13 even the ones who are trying to you know who are very good with the syllabus could get something about 13 14 very rare there'll be a 15 out of 15 student so mostly there is something that you have not done perfectly in that PNL, something that's not done perfectly. Now, what students think that if your PNL is wrong, the profit is wrong. And using the same wrong figure for my EPS calculation, what is EPS calculation? EPS is earnings per share, in which in your numerator you have your profit for the year, and in your denominator you have your outstanding shares. So, what's your thinking that if the PNL profit for the figure is wrong, you will end up using the same wrong profit figure? It's a five mark question. Why to even waste one minute on this? I know my profit is wrong. Let's leave this five mark question completely. Let's save time. Wrong approach. Completely wrong approach. Even if your profit and loss statement profit figure is completely wrong, it's okay. Carry that same wrong figure to your EPS. Carry that same wrong figure for, to your EPS. In fact, forget it. Don't even do the calculation for your PNL. You have done your revenue. You have done your cost of sales, GP. Everything is calculated. You don't have the time, much time, to calculate the profit for the year. Don't sit and calculate. Okay. Just put some figure for profit for your section. I'll just show you what I mean. This is your section A question. Uh, section A, sorry. Section B, uh, section C question, requirement A of PNL. Now you have your whole PNL, and at the end, you have your profit for the year. Okay. Now you don't have time to do the calculations. It's okay because for the total, there are no marks. For steps, there are marks, right? So you've already got your marks for steps. For total, there are no marks. You can actually put a random figure. I put 50 over here. I have EPS calculation, which is requirement to be. I'm showing in my numerator, same 50. For denominator, whatever is the share, working for shares, I'm doing that very properly. I'm doing a very properly intensive calculation for shares. But the same 50, I've just put random sum figure in the exam and same 50 I'm showing, I'm using in the numerator for EPS calculation. Trust me, if there are five marks for this, and you know your EPS answer will definitely not match with the, you know your EPS answer is definitely not going to match with the examiner's EPS answer because you're, you're using some random numerator figure. And that way, most of y'all, most of y'all figure will not match with the examiner. But y'all will be in a position to get full five marks if the remaining calculations are absolutely correct. If the remaining calculations are absolutely correct. Why? How do you get the full mark? What is this concept of ACCA? This concept of ACCA is called own figure rule. It's called own figure rule. Okay, a very important concept which not most of you all know about. In which what happens is examiner will not cut your marks two times for the same mistake. Why you have a wrong answer is because probably some mistake has been done above in the calculations. Already step marks has been cut for that. So examiner will not cut marks again for this. What he's trying to understand what he's trying to check as your ability is whether you understand EPS is profit for the year divided by weighted average shares or not. If you're using the same profit for the year, which is there in the PNM, you're good. You're good. He'll still give you full five mark if remaining everything is correct. Okay. So this mistake of leaving questions in continuity is something that you should not do. Now, next, I just need to clear up some space because, okay. So, uh, like I was saying, the third thing that we have to avoid is y'all are not showing breakup of ratio solution. When we reach to the interpretation of financial statements, y'all know that we have to do the ratios and we have to calculate ratios, we have to interpret ratios. In calculation, what y'all are doing, y'all know profit margin is gross profit upon revenue into 100. So, what y'all are doing is y'all are looking at the PNL, y'all are putting the gross profit figure on the calculator, divide by revenue figure on the calculator into 100 on the calculator, and then you're giving the answer to the examiner. That's a problem. 
because see if there are adjustments to the gross profit figure or to the revenue figure and if that was a complicated adjustment you might have made a mistake and your ratio is not going to match with what the examiner has in his answer key it's not going to match that way imagine if three ratios are asked okay you've been asked gp you've been asked operating and third we have been asked roce or return on capital employed or net asset turnover let's take net asset turnover okay three ratios in all these three ratios, you all know revenue is a common figure. Revenue is coming in the denominator, denominator. Here it's coming in the numerator. Okay, We all know that in these three ratios, revenue is coming. Now, if revenue required an adjustment and if you have not done it correctly, you have three, in all the three ratios on your calculator, you have tapped a wrong revenue figure. As a result, you have a wrong ratio, not matching with the examiner's answer sheet. What you all will get is a zero out of three. What you all will get is a zero out of three. But if you show the breakout, for your gross profit, say suppose it was 500 and revenue was say 10,000. So you have showed the breakup to examiner and then you're giving the final answer away, whatever percentage it is. Same way in operating, you have put some figure 200, but it is the same revenue figure because it's revenue that's to come in my numerator, uh, come in my denominator. So same thing. In my net asset turnover, again, that 10,000 is getting repeated three times, same figure is get, getting repeated, even though wrong. What will examiner do for the first time in your gross profit? He will cut your mark and he'll just give you half mark out of one. Okay. Second in operating, again, he knows you have a wrong ratio calculated because of wrong revenue. But this time, because of your OFR rule, he'll give you a full one mark. He will not penalize you second time for the same mistake. Okay. Likewise, for your net asset turnover also, again, you'll get a full one mark. So imagine from your zero to three, this is your comparison. This is what you could get. But even with the same answers, you're getting two and a half out of three. You're just losing half mark. Why? Why is this happening? Only because you've expanded the ratios. You've expanded the ratios. Same answers, just that you've expanded. Examiner is able to give you marks based on the OFR. So yes, this is very important. Not showing breakup is a very common mistake you'll do to be avoided. Not doing appropriate commenting. Again, a problem because you all are not doing ratio solving enough. You all don't know what is the requirement of the examiner. What he expects you to do is proper commenting, picking up points from scenarios. Okay. Scrutinizing what is the reasons for the changes. What you all are doing is you all are just writing gross profit went up. The company did really well. Okay. Gross profit went up. Company did really well. Is something even a high school student could have looked at the gross profit if it's going up and could comment gross profit is going up. Company is doing well. This is not as this is not what is expected out of you at a FR level in a professional course. You have to identify the reason that why the gross profit could have gone up. What is it in the organization that has contributed to it? Even in the real world, some analysis is required in your end financial statements, right? Because if there are movements from current year to last year, very significant auditor normally requires you to explain the reasons for those movements. So ratio analysis is done. Ratio analysis is done. And then you have to give the comments for the reasons. So even in the real world, in the, even in the corporate world, ratio commenting is a very useful thing, okay? a very useful skill. So yes, you have to give reasons for the changes. Okay, You have to pick point from the scenario that what happened in the company which is contributing to my GP change or my operating change or my ROCE change. If there is nothing in the scenario, then you're free to imagine what the problem could be, what the problem could be or what the reason could be. Okay, Next. Over time invested in sub questions. Over time invested in sub questions. Now, what's the problem? Y'all sometimes get so engrossed in solving a MCQ of section A or a B, or even in section C, a five mark sub question, or just one adjustment, a difficult adjustment that you see for consolidation or single entity. You all over invest time. Understand that for that particular question, there are limited marks. There are limited marks, okay? Either if it's a section A, B type, maximum two marks are there. If you miss, you lose maximum two marks. Or if it's a section C type one adjustment you're doing, again, there could be three mark dedicated to it, four mark dedicated to it, but not more than that, right? So if you end up spending good half an hour for these four mark questions or two mark questions, it's not cool. Not even 15 marks you should be spending for this. Not even 15 minutes, sorry. Not even 15 minutes you should be spending for this. You all know the rule. One mark, 1.8 minute. Don't exceed that. One mark, 1.8 minute. Don't exceed that. Why? We're not, let's not forget our goal. What is our goal? We're trying to, in this quarter itself, crack the FR paper and come out of the hall. 
that's what we're trying to do we want to pass this paper see getting a rank is second but first is to crack the paper right so we want to pass the paper in this attempt and then move on because repeating the quote is definitely not wise so what are we proving by giving the best or a perfect mcq answer there's nothing that we are proving that's not our mission we're not going to go and tell anyone that you know what i have done the best question 14 answer that's not what we are aiming for right i've done the best answer for consolidation uh difficult adjustment that's not our aim our aim is to pass the paper so let's not forget our aim let's not over invest time okay in sub questions lastly panicking for unique adjustments when you see a unique adjustment when you see a difficult question the panic and then that panic is what we carry forward to the remaining questions very wrong very wrong why is it that in the entire paper everything is going to be a comfort zone and there's nothing that is going to be surprise element no till from your from your uh, uh, you know first grade probably till now you know we have cracked so many exams and every time an exam we have encountered some element which was not a comfort zone which was not a comfort zone so we're already trained for that why do we still panic it's all the ways that a paper is designed in such a manner that if a student is studying for if a student is giving decent time he'll be able to pass the paper but if the student is giving extra time covering every nook and corner going beyond the books then for those kind of students, there are some five to 10 marks designed, which are very difficult, which only the rankers can crack probably, right? So every paper is designed in that manner for the rankers because there are students who have taken a next level effort to do justice with their, with their preparation, right? To do justice with their preparation. So if you see that 10 mark uncomfortable element and panic, it's not making sense. There are good 90 marks, 80 marks, 70 marks, which are your comfort zone. Why are you wasting those 60, 70 marks? At the end, we just need 50 marks to pass the paper. Why for a 10, 20 uncomfortable mark, you know, risk our remaining marks, risk our remaining comfort, comfortable areas? Let's not risk our remaining comfortable areas, okay? Always remember. So never panic. Along with you, every student in the hall is facing that situation who is coming across that crap, crap question, yeah? That difficult question. So every other student is facing that situation. So yes, these are few things that I want you all to remember so that you all don't fail in this quarter. Okay, and you'll pass in the first attempt. If you've not passed in the first attempt, this is the second time you're giving, then don't repeat these mistakes. Don't repeat these mistakes, okay? Next, there was something that I spoke about cheat sheets. If you'll enter and enroll the Wi-Fi course, this is just a sample screenshot that I'm showing that how revenue I have shrunken to just one page or note. Okay, like that, there are so many other topics which is which has been shrunk to one page of notes. This you all will get access if you all enroll for the reset the batch. Okay, now <clears throat> what is the next 40 day plan? Okay, what is the next 40 day plan? Let's look at that. Now, you'll know before the exam, we have 40 days to go. There are, if to be more precise, there are actually 43, but I wouldn't count the you know last three days before the exam, not really. Okay, so anyway, I have designed this. Uh, planner for january month and february month march 4th you all know you all have your exam so march three days i'm not even counting okay i'm not even counting so in january month what do you what you should do if you all have failed the paper and if you all have you all are now looking to take control over the syllabus in january month what you should be focusing at i'd suggest start with your consolidations now already you all have done it for the first time so you all don't know anything but just in case you all don't know anything in this recent batch you all are getting going to get access to everything pretty much you are going to have access to the recordings uh the pre-recorded lectures the live sessions that were conducted with the regular fr students that is in the form of recorded session available to you all coming live sessions you all will have access to that in the uh, as a live uh, as a live session only you all will be having access to the zoom link you all will be able to enter my live recording or live sessions okay for the coming sessions the sessions that are already gone for that we have a pre-recorded material that you all can watch so already that is there cheat sheets are going to be available for you all question practices are going to be available for you all so all of this is there and with that with the help of all this access you should be able to take control of what i'm right now flashing on screen okay now, like I said, in the month of January, what you should take control over is in the initial uh, phase that is still the first nine days of your January month, the nine days of your January month, you all should take control over consolidation topic. 
So you all, I've even given date wise that because I'm not counting today's date. I'm assuming today's date has already gone into today's live session. So tomorrow you all can watch the consolidation of balance sheet lecture. You will be ending, you'll end up doing one question practice along with the live lecture because I'll be actually doing one question live practice. The next day, which is the second day of your uh, uh, practice, you will end up doing four questions of consolidation of balance sheet independently yourself, okay? And one section B type. From where you will do all these practice, the section C type question, when I say four questions of consolidation, these are all section C 20 mark topic. That you all will have access through any of the kits if you all take. If you take Kaplan kit, if you take BPP kit, if you take any kit, past questions are already there, right? So any four 20 mark questions you all will drill. And one section B type from where? Section A and B type strictly from study hub. Strictly from study hub. This is one more common mistake that you all have made is you all have not practiced questions from study hub if you have, if you have failed. Study hub will open your eyes to those questions which is the language of the examiner. Okay? If you just drill Kaplan, if you just drill BPP, you are still not aware of what are the question types that the examiner can ask. Is why the best way to go about it is if you don't touch Kaplan and BPP, it's still cool do all your study hub questions. Do all your study hub questions, okay? Study hub is your ACCA body's platform, freely available if you're an ACCA student, which you can go and practice all these. So yes, uh, the third day I've kept as a buffer, just in case you all have not been able to achieve the target in of the first two days, then the buffer day could be used to cover the remaining targets. Even the working crowd might not be able to stick to this, so buffer day could be used by them to cover it. Okay, now... Next, like that, in the similar manner, I'm not going to discuss every line item in detail, but I'm just giving you an overall view now that next pattern, same pattern you'll follow for your consolidation of PNL. Watch the lecture, do the question practice. Again, you have a buffer day to cover anything remaining. Then you have your uh, day to watch associates lecture, practice associates. With this five, five, five question on each topic, five on balance sheet, five on PNL, and five on associates, you have already practiced by nine in nine days. You've already practiced. Good 15 questions on consolidation. Good 15 questions on consolidations, which are your 20 mark type, which are your 20 mark type. So already the first, at least two, you all have three topics to cover. You all have three topics to cover from section C type, which are your 20 markers. So at least you all have taken control over one topic. At least you all have taken over control over one topic in the first 10 days or nine days to be more precise. For the first nine days, one topic already taken control. Okay, then in the remaining three days of the January month, you all will cover your non-current asset related topic like your I-16, investment property, borrowing costs, government grant, intro to IFRS, all this you will cover in the remaining three days of January. Okay, so your non-current assets family is what you will try to cover. So in the January month, consolidation, non-current assets, done, gone. Okay. Now, February month, what we are trying to take control over is your remaining 20 mark topic, like your single entity, your uh, ratio interpretation. So in the first four days rigorous, single, single, single chapters you will take. Watch the lecture, practice all section A and B questions from study hub for that topic. Same day, watch the lecture and practice all section A and B questions from study hub same day. That thing, that same thing you'll repeat for the next four chapters, financial instruments, taxation, revenue, okay? And lastly, the fifth day, you will touch your single entity 20 mark. Okay. You already have three section CSUMs pre recorded on the portal. You all will watch that. Next day, again, you all will try to watch the three pre recorded sums. I'm trying to cater as much as I can today in terms of doing more single entity practice. So, one to two, definitely I'll be able to cater today itself. Those only you can probably watch on the sixth. Then, uh, then in the coming days, like how did you, how you all did your independent practice of consolidation, you all will continue, continue to do single entity practice till 9th, till 9th. So again, in the nine days of February, you have taken control over your small, small chapters, okay, small, small chapters, which make up the one entire single entity question, because you all know single entity question is made up of small, small chapters, adjustments, leases, financial instruments, taxation, revenue, non-current assets. The I-16 and everything. So in the first nine days, again, the next topic is over. The second topic is over, okay, for section C. Then you have your cash flows. You can take a breather. Cash flows is not a heavy topic. You can watch cash flows. And then in the 11th, again, the next 30, 20 mark topic, which is interpretation of financial statements. You all will have to dedicate good four days, good back-to-back -back four days for your ratios. Take control over that. Take control over ratios. 12, 13 questions of ratios is what I'm, 
asking you all to practice in this phase. 13 questions of ratios is what I'm asking you all to practice in this phase. Once this is done, all your section C type are done. All your section C type are done. Even from section A and B perspective, all important topics have catered by this time. This is when? Till the mid of February. Till 14th Feb, all important topics, section A, B, C, done. Till 15th Feb. After uh, till 14th Feb. After 14th Feb, what you are doing are very small topics. 15, 16, 17, 18. These are very small, tiny, tiny, tiny topics that you're covering. Okay, very tiny, tiny topics. So again, watch the lecture, practice section A and B sums in these coming four days for that. 19th, 20, 21st are your buffer days before your revision of all concepts, all your mocks and everything. So three, three days buffer day you have before the revision session starts, before your mock starts. So that way you can plan your coming 40 days. You can plan your coming 40 days. In the first 30 days itself, you can see syllabus is completed. You can see the 30 day mark. Syllabus is completed from your end, conceptually and practice wise. Last 10 days are for revision or mocks and all of that. So 30 days, syllabus is in control. Okay. Now the working crowd might find a little difficult to stick to this. So what I'd request is if 12 marks is what I have asked or 15 questions were asked for balance sheet practice, then you might not be able to do 15 questions. So at least you all will try to cater 75% of what has been requested for the regular crowd. So if not 15, at least cover 10 questions. Okay, that way maybe your uh, goal will be a little lesser compared to the regular students, but not that you can't, you won't touch anything. Definitely you will bring into your practice all of this. In this bracket, in this frame, you have to keep yourself really strong mentally, physically. You have to be motivated. You have to keep yourself really healthy because there's a good working that you have to do before your exam, right? Post-exam, yeah, you're free to take the break. But in these coming days, mentally, physically, you have to be strong, you have to be healthy, you have to be fresh so that all these targets can be achieved. Okay? Now, next. Uh, those who have not joined the WIFI course probably are not aware of how we teach at WIFI. So there's a combination of few things that you all should be aware of. We have recorded sessions recorded session so it's not that you have to wait for a live session to cover topics you already have access to so much material if you have ample of time if you're not working student if you want to take control over a good chunk of syllabus in advance you can do before uh even without using my planner if you have your own plan to you know cover a lot of syllabus in some in few days you're all, by all means you can do that because recorded sessions are anyway available live classes are going to be there on the weekends mostly on fridays live sessions are on fridays uh, if needed, extra class could be taken on a Saturday or Sunday. If needed, that's only uh, when I inform you all. The e-notes are available for you all. TTA model is something where you all are doing assignments and it's getting marked by your um, the teacher's assistant. Basically, my assistant would mark this for you all. So this model is also there. Mock exam. You all already saw in the planner, mock exam is there. A grand revision is there in which two days we'll be doing a marathon of question practice, a marathon, continuous question practice. We'll drill many questions, many questions, okay? Two days. One day we will deduct, uh, we will uh, dedicate for revising concepts, revising concepts, okay? And two days for practicing. This is towards the end. Performance tracking, again, Afan, the assistant would share your performance on the group timely basis that how much of it is there that you have been watching and how much is it that you have not watched, okay? All this through performance stacking will enter into your gamification model. The gamification model is that for all of this timely watching of lectures, timely assignments, submissions, everything, you all will be scoring points, okay? You all will be scoring points for all of this. And basis how much points you all collect, basis how much points you all collect, this you all will be able to utilize for your next subject. How you will be able to utilize for your next subject? These points will give you discount. It will give you a discount percentage for next subject. So all this is getting tracked. You will also have your performance tracking time to time coming up in the group with your name. It will get published openly in the group. So you know where you are standing, where others are standing. This That acts like a motivation only for you to know how much to cover. Okay. And like I said, if you're doing things on time, then you're collecting points, basis which you get discount percentage for your next subjects. Yeah. So this is it. This is what this is this is this was what I wanted to communicate with you all 
for the research students. The last thing that if you all have any inquiry uh, that you all want to do, then you all will have to contact the WhatsApp support team. Okay, you all will have to contact the WhatsApp support team. Uh, you all have relevant numbers, website address, and everything of here at the bottom right corner. Okay, I suggest you all to continue watching the lecture because, like I said, now I'm going to start with a single entity practice. Okay, single entity practice. But what we'll do is we'll take a five minute break, five rather ten minutes break. We'll take a ten minute break and then continue with single entity practice. So it's eight twenty five almost. So eight thirty five we'll get back again. Eight thirty five we'll get back again. This probably for you all is plus five GMT and eight five. Okay. 8.5. Basis the plus 5 GMT timing. 8.5 is when we'll get back. All right, guys, please come back. The break is over. In two minutes, I'll begin the session again for your FR regular batch. Students who have come for just the orientation can also continue to watch. I'm practicing full length 20 mark questions on single entity. you all to please come to the CBEPT platform in your address bar just type CBEPT enter you will be redirected to a google page where you can click the CBET ACC global platform page that's the first page that would come so please click that click your relevant email id after that you are on this page where you're going to sign in through your username ACC id and password Okay, so when you're you're on this page, you'll on the right side see a catalog. Under catalog, you can click your financial reporting, and there are ACC official resources, and then there is a blank workspace. So you have to go to your blank workspace, and you will see an assign option. If you've already assigned, then you'll see an unassign option. Okay, like for me, I've already assigned it to myself. Is that I have see I see an unassign option. You should see a assign option if you have not assigned. Once you click the assign option on the left hand side, the FR past and practice papers and blank work workspaces this should appear. Okay, so you can click your blank workspaces and resume. Now on your blank workspace, this is going to be blank for you. For you, I have done my past some question practice here is why it's filled up. But anyway, you will see a blank word space. This word space would be used for your ratio interpretation practice. On the left hand side, you will see a scenario in the exam. Okay, the question scenario. And on the uh, blank word space, just on top of that, you will see the requirement like uh, comment on the performance of the organization, B, comment on the position or do the ratio calculation. Those requirements will be up here. Okay. Uh, you have to come and use the screen, navigate it, and see what all you can do. Control C, Control op V options works or not. All this, what will be available in the real exam day is what something you can come and test from here. See, shrinking and, uh, you know, uh, squeezing this is also a possibility. Just that become familiar with it because there are some, you know, glitches here. Not glitches, but there is a way to do it. It's not very easy just to click it and drag it. Uh, just try it and you will know what I mean. It gets kind of stuck, you know, in a way, in a particular way. So you would want to practice all this over here. Anyway, right now what we are drilling are single entity questions. So you might want to come to question one is blank workspace, right? So question number two is where you would want to come to, where you will have your spreadsheet given to you. Yeah, this is just like your Excel. Okay, this is just like your Excel. But uh, many things of Excel would not be here also. Many functions of Excel would not work. So you have to come do enough question practice of 20 marks so that you become familiar with what will be available and what will not be available on the exam day. So my previous question, I'm just deleting it from practice that we have I had done with the live in the live session. Okay. Now you might want to see if copy paste function works. So copy paste. Okay, it should ideally work. But uh, this is something where you can assign yourself a CB specimen paper. Okay, and from specimen paper, just see if copy paste option works. Ideally, this should have worked. Yeah, see it is working. So what is not working is when I'm doing a right click and copy. And then when I'm doing a right click and paste, this is not working. But when I highlight it and on my keyboard, when I type control C, I highlight and on my keyboard, I type control C and then I come to the spreadsheet and I type control V. This function is working. So even if copy paste function works, you should know in the spreadsheet 
how to utilize it. Not from mouse, but from keyboard it's working. Okay, not from mouse, but from keyboard it's pretty much working. So yes, all this you have to come and experience it. Now, anyway, what I'll do is we'll move to a question over here. So there is there are already three pre-recorded questions on single entity. I want to drill more questions with you all. So come to this question called Clarion. Okay, come to this question called Clarion. In your Kaplan book, you can find it. In your any other BPP kit also, you could find it. But this is this is basically your past paper, right? So you can find it in past papers. Clarion question on single entity. I'm giving you all time. Go to your CBT platform. Enter it. Try to get ready with the spreadsheet. Okay. Come to Clarion question also and get ready. Okay. So I believe at this point you all are ready with the question. Um, yes, the recording for the session is definitely going to be available. Like every other live session, this live session will also be available. Okay. So yes, I've taken this question on Word so that I could do my markings while explaining. Okay, so I'm going to come to the question requirement and read the requirement of this question. It's a 20 mark single entity question. Requirement A says prepare Clarion statement of financial position as the 31st March 2015. So what they're asking us is financial position, which means you all know they're asking you your balance sheet and this is good 15 mark, okay? Second, they're asking prepare extracts from the statement of cash flows for Clarion. So they're asking cash flows. We've not done cash flows yet is why I will not cater this five mark activity right now, but I'll cater the 15 marks financial position right now. Okay. Now, even before I read any adjustment, any background, just like your consolidation sum, I'll get ready with blocking space for my balance sheet sum. Okay. I'll draw the structure for balance sheet and then I'll start the sum. Okay. Now, I would want to just, however, read the background before I do this. Okay. I would want to read the background. So what they say is after preparing a draft statement of profit or loss for the year ended 30th September 2014 and adding the year's profit before any adjustment required by notes 1 to 5 below to retain earnings, the summarized trial balance of Clarion as at 31st March 2015 is as follows. Okay. So after preparing a draft PNL, so they have made a draft PNL and adjustments over here are not done. Not, well, note 1 to 5 are not done by them. So we will cater it. And when we do the notes one to five, you all know PNL impacts will come. PNL changes will come. So when we draft a balance sheet, when we make a balance sheet, the outdated retain earning figure that you see over here, the retain earning figure, though it's written 31st March 2015, will undergo a change. So if you can either have an approach that when we do a balance sheet and when we have under equity side the retain earning, in the bracket you're showing all the adjustments. But the point is there'll be too many adjustments. There are five notes and there'll be too many adjustments pertaining to retain earnings because uh, p &L adjustments would be a lot normally in your uh, single entity sum. So you can have a dedicated working one for your retain earnings where you have your draft retain earnings. You start with your draft retain earnings, which is your 33,100. And then to that, you make adjustments, which one by one after reading all the adjustments, you will get a final retain earning which then you can take to your balance sheet so i'll pre prefer this working one up note one approach where i do a working dedicated for retain earning rather than doing everything in the bracket okay i'll prefer this approach over anything okay so i have a question on sbr okay so uh if there is an orientation for the students sitting first time for the SBR exam. So there is an orientation for SBR exam students, which is already, the live session for this has already been catered, uh, you know, a good few weeks ago. And the recording of that is available on YouTube also, okay? So you can watch that. And if you mean the recent batch for SBR orientation, orientation for the recent batch of SBR, then that is yet to be conducted, which is going to get conducted tomorrow, Okay. Tomorrow, 7 p.m. plus 5 GMT. So I think if you're here for SBR, then you're in a probably wrong batch. This is for FR. Tomorrow is the SBR session here. I hope that's clear. Okay, anyway, continuing now. So like I said, now we're going to get run with the structure of balance sheet first. So what I do is I would want to practice this with you all on the CBET platform. So let's do it over here. Not consolidated. I'm so used to doing consolidated with your statement of financial position. Here you'll have amounts, and normally you all know you all are writing amount in thousands. 
So you all can write high apostrophe dollar three zeros because otherwise if you don't put that apostrophe it won't come properly you can check if i just put three zeros it will show as one zero if i put dollar three zeros it will still show as one zero so apostrophe when you put it reflects as three zero okay now i'm going to get done with the structure so assets under which i'll have non-current assets for sure then i'll have current assets then i'll have total assets and this is something that has to happen real fast because uh, you all know assets, there are no marks for like structures and all. It's step marks for everything else. So it's not something that you can devote a lot of time. Box spaces for my main subheadings. I'll have to the right my working notes. Working note one is where I do my reading. Retain earnings workings. So I'll have my draft retain earnings and then I'll have my final. Um, this section, this part that the first drafting of balance sheet that you do for the structure can be as much detailed as you want. Okay. So if you want to just block spaces, you block spaces, you read the adjustment. When you read there is an adjustment related to PPE, then you draw the PPE line. Else, in the first instance itself, you can see how much detailed the balance sheet is and finish it off. So I can see equity shares, retain earnings, loan notes. Fine. I'll go by all means and fill. Equity shares, retain earnings, loan notes in the loan note category. This also helps me then while solving the adjustment quickly to put items at the relevant place. Plant and equipment ROU. So this all will go in my... PPE section, accumulated depreciation, how we present in the balance sheet, you all know, from your PPE, you net it off. You don't show as a separate accumulated depreciation, but normally you'll net it off for your exam purposes. So all for all these three items, just a PPE line would do. Investments through profit and loss. So for this, I'll just write investments. In the balance sheet, I'll just write investments. So PPE and investments under non-current assets. Then you have your inventory, trade receivables, and bank. All of these are my current assets items. So inventory, trade receivables, and bank. For trade receivables, you can write a TR also. It's okay. It's not a problem. You can use short forms. I've already asked the examining team. They said they will not cut marks for short forms. So it's absolutely okay. Then we have deferred tax, trade payables, environmental provision. So deferred tax will go under non-current liability. Trade payables. <clears throat> Environmental provision, lease liability. It's all looks like non current liability elements. Okay, then loan note interest paid. So, loan note interest paid normally would be a hitting bank and debit my PL item. So, I don't see any place in balance sheet. Okay, no place in balance sheet. This is my PL item. Suspense account. Only when I read the adjustment, I'll know what to do with the suspense account. Investment income PL item. Again, no place in balance sheet. So I'm done pretty much with all the items in my trial balance. I can begin solving now. Okay. So my rough balance sheet is already over. And coming to my working notes and reading the first adjustment now. First adjustment. So. <clears throat> They're saying on 31st March 2015, that is my year and only, okay? My, on 31st March 2015, one quarter of the 8% loan notes were redeemed at par and six months outstanding loan interest was paid. So on 31st March, one quarter of the 8% loan notes were redeemed at par, meaning they were paid normally up until now if you do any single entity sum and if you have borrowed loan you don't make a payment till the redemption date if you have borrowed say for example 20 million loan then that entire 20 million is getting paid when the redemption date is coming that is after five years six years seven years whenever it is it will come after that many years okay so you don't make a quarter payment a half uh, amount of payment but what year has happened is for the first time the only question where one quarter of the loan notes are already being paid by the year end not a problem this also we can very easily incorporate in a table i'll show you how anyway uh redeem that par and six months outstanding six months outstanding loan interest was paid okay 
so they're saying only six months was outstanding which means six months interest uh the other half of the interest was probably paid earlier that's fine the suspense account represents the debit entry corresponding to the cash payment for capital redemption and outstanding interest so they're talking something about suspense account and if you may recall we saw a suspense account and they're saying this is the debit entry corresponding to cash payment so you did a cash payment so credit is your bank so what they did is they put the debit for the payment what they did that quarter of the payment that they have done they have put the remaining amount in suspense account while if they are making a payment towards loan it was the loan account that they were to hit not suspense account it was the loan account that they were supposed to hit right so we know now what adjustment is required so now come to your trial balance come to your trial balance and see what all is there pertaining to your loan note okay so i can see eight percent loan notes and note one reference is given okay uh, at the bottom also you can see loan note interest paid and note one reference given suspense account and note one reference given three items are pertaining to this note one in eight percent loan notes what do i have i have a twenty thousand, which means actually a 20 million worth of loan note sitting okay in loan note interest paid, what do I have? A 800 debit balance, a 800 debit balance. And suspense account, what do I have? 5,800 debit balance. So why do why can I why do I see a 5,800 or 5,800 thousand? It's simply because if you do a if you'll do a quarter of this face value of 20, just do a quarter. Quarter means one by four. What are you going to get? 5,000. So this denotes this 5,800 denotes that quarter payment. The quarter payment plus they said half outstanding interest half outstanding interest so half outstanding interest is 800 the other half half outstanding interest is another 800 so what they should have or, or done is ideally they should have done a working not a working but what they should have done is for the loan note whatever is my bought forward value from that on that they will incur interest amount and then they'll make an interest payment amount which is your coupon rate and then you will have your carry forward figure this is what we have done in our chapter this is what we have done in our chapter. So what is the bought forward amount in this case? It's a 20,000. The interest that we incur is basis. The coupon rate 8%. So 8% on two, 20 million we'll do. I believe you'll get a 1,600. Yeah, you'll get a 1,600. The payment that you're doing is in two, two installments, 800 interest, 800 interest, you're doing it. But other than the interest element for the first time in a question, in a historic question, you're making the redemption also of loan value so quarter of this is also being paid so what will this leave me with 15 million so in my balance sheet now i'll have a 15 million worth of loan note remaining 15 million worth of loan note remaining and two debit items of finance cost which should have got recorded in the pnl as finance cost they have not put it over there i can see already a trial balance line items in some other lines like a suspense account and loan note into paid line items some other lines not finance cost and forget finance costs, this is not even entered my retained earnings. Ideally, this impact of 1600 should have been in my retained earnings. This should have been in my 1600 should have been in my retained earnings. But the fact that it's still inside my, it's still open in my trial balance, even if I have a retained earnings of 31st March, still these two items are sitting, means they're not transferred to my retained earnings yet. The impact is not gone. So I'll have to deliberately pass this. I'll have to deliberately pass it. So I hope it's been understood by everyone now. So just this impact, I'll go and pass it now. So working to loan notes, bought forward, so just shrink the space a little bit. Yeah, bought forward, interest, less is your coupon payment. Or what is paid and what is carried for. So 20,000 was bought forward. Interest 8% if you apply on 20,000. I have 1,600. Two payments had happened. We have saw on scene of 800, 800. So 1,600 payment has happened. But also along with that, a capital redemption has taken place of 5 million quarter. So that makes it carry forward figure of 15,000 okay so in my balance sheet I already have made place for loan notes I'll have to link this up second 
in my balance sheet, I will have to, in my retained earnings working, I'll have to do the less finance cost impact, which is negative interest rate. Okay, so pertaining to loan, pertaining to my note one or adjustment one, whatever was to be done, whatever was required to be done, I have done everything. I read the adjustment, I tried to analyze, I tried to see which items in my trial balance are connecting with the note one. I quickly analyze the situation, I've passed them back. Whatever marks were around note one, I've already got that. Gone. Not going to think about it. Okay. Now, just in case you think there is some mistake, you're not confident about what you've done, it's okay. That problem, leave it then and there and move on. Some marks at least you're going to get. If this is unique also, at least some marks you'll be in a position to get. There are other students also in the class who are probably struggling like you, okay, in the exam for this adjustment. So, it's okay. Just move on. That's the best thing that we can do. Now, property, plant and equipment. Included in the property, plant and equipment is an item of plant with a cost of yeah, included in property, plant and equipment is an item of plant with a cost of 14 million purchased on 1st April 2014, meaning beginning of this year end, beginning of this year end. However, the plant will cause environmental damage, which will have to be rectified when it is dismantled at the end of its five year life. So there is a five year life. The present value discounting at 8% on 1st April 2014 of the rectification is 4, 4 million. The environmental provision has been correctly accounted for. So they have correctly accounted for it. Okay, it's there as a liability. It's there in my PPE. As per I-16, you all know you all have to account for it. It's already correctly accounted for. However, no finance cost has yet been charged on the provision. What is the problem? <coughs> the finance cost has not been charged on the provision. So we'll do that. The balance sheet provision item is an outdated item for 1st April. We'll have to increase it by the finance cost element. Also, that finance cost will impact my retain earnings. So, two things here. Next. No depreciation has yet been charged on plant and equipment, which should be charged to cost of sales on a straight line basis for a five-year life. No plant is more than four years old. Okay. Fine. So, anyway, depreciation is something that I have to pass on five years, which is 20% or you can do divide by five, whatever you all like. So I'll go to my balance sheet. I'll check the property, plant, and equipment. The good part is that this 14 million, this 4 million, these impacts are already there in my balance sheet PP. I don't have to deliberately do anything for that. I just have to pass the depreciation impact. So go to your balance sheet, trial balance. And let's check now, which are my property, plant, and equipment note to related items. So what I'll do is I'll just change the color of my highlighter i'll keep all the highlights probably it will make things a little easier for you all yeah so my property plant and equipment note 2 is 77000 then i have another item environmental provision note 2 for 4000 which is outdated anything else for note 2 um ideally this should have also been for note 2 yeah because accumulated depreciation on plant and equipment so this should have also been for note 2. No problem. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Accumulated should have also been there. They have not marked it as note 2. But this should have also been there ideally. <coughs> okay. So anyway, uh, we'll do the working for plant and equipment. Now let's go to our uh, CBEPT platform. So working 3. Historical cost. I'm just writing HC. I don't have a lot of time in the exams. So I'm not writing full forms. I'm writing H HC. Less accumulated depreciation. Which is in the balance sheet as 19,000. I have carrying value at the beginning. Okay, 58,000. Less depreciation for your... Your I'll have to be very careful. You'll have to be very careful because when I do the depreciation for the for, for this period, is it straight line or is it written down value method will play a role? They are saying that the depreciation is uh basis fire life. So if it's if they're saying it's basis fire life, then do I pass the fire life on 77,000 or 77 less 19? Come, bot come to the bottom. And you can see uh, no depreciation has yet been charged on uh, 
plant and equipment which should be charged to cost of sales on straight line basis. You can see in the question, it's written straight line basis, which means do not charge it on your carry forward figure. Do not charge it on the carry forward figure, but on the historical cost, okay, on the historical cost. So that's not a problem. We can pretty much do that. Depreciation is going to be 77,000 into 1 by 5, which is 15,400. So carrying value at the end. Forty-two six hundred. Forty-two six hundred. So I would want to put this in my balance sheet in the bracket. Forty-two six hundred. Second, the depreciation of that because not entered already, I will have to enter it deliberately in my retain only. On plant and equipment, I'll try to use short forms as much as I can as I want to save a lot of time of mine. So I'm linking this as 15400. Okay. Coming back to the original question. Now, the note 2 again, no, 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 no. Not that I have done everything. I still have to do the impacts for provision because if you all may recall, provision has been, yes, it's been recorded, but finance cost on it has not been recorded. So no problem, come back to the question and check how much of the provision has been recorded. So we can see 4 million has been correctly recorded as a liability. Finance cost on it basis 8% is something that I'll record. So yes, I'll do that. Working for environmental provision. So at the beginning of the year, 4 million add finance cost or bracket you can write unwinding whatever you all want to it's 8% of 4000 or 4 million which is so your end figure is 4 million 320,000 <coughs> so this is going to go and sit in my balance sheet this was oddly sitting, I don't know. Anyway. So four million three twenty thousand in my balance sheet. Link the cells. Okay. Now next this three twenty, the finance cost is a PL item. So this also will have to go and sit in my retain earnings working. So let's or I've already done above for finance cost, right? So in this bracket, now I can show 1,600, the older one, plus 320, the fresh one. So together, probably it can come here. Okay. So now I am done with this. Now I believe note two, everything that was to be done is done. Depreciation calculation, finance cost calculation over. Note three. The right of use of plant was acquired on 1st April 2014 under a five-year lease with an initial deposit of 2.3 million and annual payments of 1.5 million on 31st March each year. So they're saying a ROU, a right of use of plant was acquired. When will this happen? When will this happen? This can happen only in the case of a lease. You're entering into a lease arrangement. You're entering into a lease arrangement. IFRS 16 is when you will get a ROU. And again, at the beginning of the year, this was acquired under a five-year lease period with an initial deposit of 2.3 million. Okay, so initial deposit is 2.3. Annual payments of 1.5 million on 31st March each year were made. Okay, so 31st March annual payments means this is an arrears. This is a case of arrears. You all know this is very important to identify whether it's an advance or an arrears because your table for calculation, calculating your year and these will depend upon whether it's an arrears or an advance. Okay. Now, the present value of annual payments under the lease, excluding the initial deposit, okay, excluding the initial deposit at 1st April 2014 was 5.7 million. So, your initial lease liability measurement is already given to you in the question. This is your initial lease liability measurement. Initial lease liability. Already given to you in the question and most of the times you all know it's given. The lease had an implicit rate of 10% and ROU has been correctly capitalized. The lease liability in the trial balance above represents the initial lease liability less the first annual payment. Okay. Now you'll know that 
initially is liability is 5.7 but if you have to calculate the initial measurement for rou how do you go about it it's the initial lease liability which in this case is 5.7 plus any payments made on the same day or advance plus any direct costs plus any dismantle so i don't see any other payments other than my uh initial lease liability and the initial deposit so this together will form my rou which will become 8 million so my rou is going to be 8 million and my lease liability is 5.7 Okay, so I'll do a dedicated working for this. I'll also see what all has been done already in the trial balance for this. So come to your note, three related items. Come to your note, three related items. <clears throat> so you can see your ROU correctly capitalized in the balance sheet as 8 million. This is also the figure that we just found. Then you have your lease liability for the first year as 4,200,000. But what would be required for your lease liability is a split between current and non-current liability. If you may recall, we've done this chapter and you will not get full marks till you don't show the split properly between current and non-current. So I'll have to do the bot forward table to do this uh, current non-current liability split. Okay. Anything else pertaining to my note 3 doesn't look like. So I can go ahead and I can do this uh, calculation. So come to your um, spreadsheet and what I need is now a next working, working five dedicated for lease liability. Where again I have a initial ROU as 8 million, which is fine. Initial lease liability is 5.7 if i'm not wrong let me just cross check once more yep 5.7 and i need to do subsequent liability measurements this is what forward add the interest element plus the payment this is your effective rate and then you will have your can so my bought forward for the lease is 5700 the interest that I'll incur is the implicit rate in the lease, which is implicit <coughs> rate in the lease is ten percent. Okay, so I'll do the use of that ten percent, and then I am making annual payments. I want to just confirm once more what my annual payments were, and it was one point five million annually. So less one thousand five hundred will give me a carry. So for your first year, you have a figure of 4770. Um, I don't know if that's the same figure given to you in the question. Let's check. So they have an odd figure of 4,200,000 for the first year. We wouldn't know why that is. We will still stick to doing our correct calculation, which is showing as 4770. We'll just cross check yeah this is my initial liability the interest element will be 10 percent on the bot forward payments are 1 million 500 so this is making up for 4 million 770 that's correct <clears throat> now just in case if you add this up is it coming to 4200 what are they trying to show in the trial balance is what i'm looking at yeah so what they have not done is they have not done the unwinding okay unwinding of the present value is what they have not done is why they are getting a 4200 figure so anyway now this is my first year calculation when did i enter into it when did i enter into it in the beginning of the current year i'll have to still do a calculation for the next year because you all know that i have to find a split between current and non-current liability that's only possible if i go to the next year calculation because what how do you do it how do you do the split listen to this line it's very important whatever remains after payment in the next year is your non-current liability. So at this first year end, if I just put 4770 in the balance sheet, I will not get full marks. I will get marks, but not full marks. So to get my full marks, I'll show a split of current non-current liability. So I'll go to the next year. I'll calculate the interest element. I'll do the payment. And at this point now what remains, at this point now what remains is my non-current liability. At 3747 is my non-current liability. Then what will my current liability be? Current liability will be the 4770 minus the non-current element will give you your current liability of 1023. Of 1023. 
Okay, so this is how you would ideally go about it. So I'll show all of this. First, the first year's interest that 570 should sit as a finance cost in my PL. So I'll show this in my retail earnings working. This finance cost 570 should also come here. So that's coming up to 2490. In the balance sheet, I would want to show a lease liability split. Mm -hmm. So current liability also I'll have lease liability. And I'll link the cells. Non-current is this much. G44. So G45 is current. So instead of dragging and wasting my time, I can also write this G45. So I have the current non-current liability split already. Okay. So now probably whatever was required to extract from note 3, I have done that. But still one more thing remains. I have done ROU initial measurement. What I also need to do is a year-end measurement because you all know ROU undergoes depreciation. Undergoes depreciation. So on my ROU also I'll have depreciation. Life is 5 years. So not a problem. I'll take year-end ROU as well. So my initial ROU is this. Take it at the bottom. So depreciation. ROU. Which is coming up to 1600. So I'll go and enter the 1600. You all may know or you all may recall that depreciations were also something that is not recorded. So less depreciation on ROU. <clears throat> and in my balance sheet, I'll have this ROU also recorded as what figure I have over here. Your end. 6,400. I have a carrying value of 6,400. So let's take that. Okay. So it looks like now at this point, I feel like now, yes, we have catered everything pertaining to node 3, right? There was ROU. ROU, subsequent measurement, did that. Did the depreciation impact. There was lease liability, subsequent measurement, finance cost impact. Did that. Subsequent measurement and finance cost impact. Everything done. So you can see already that how your single entity sum is going to be from so many different chapters. Okay, next. The note four. The investments through profit or loss are those held at 31st March 2015 after the sale below. They carried at their fair values as at 1st April 2014. However, they had a fair value of 6.5 million on 31st March 2015. Okay, so currently... You'll know that this is from your chapter fair value through, uh, this is from your chapter financial instruments. They're saying the investments are recorded through profit and loss. And if this is the case, then you all know every year end you'll have to do a fresh remeasurement. They are carried at a fair value at 1st April and they had a carrying value of 6.5 million on 31st March. Fair value of on 31st March. Okay, so in the trial balance, you see an outdated amount of 1st April. However, the fresh value is 6.5 million. During the year, an investment which had a carrying amount of 1.4 million was sold for 1.6 million. Investment income in the trial balance above includes the profit on the sale of investments and dividends received during the year. Okay, no problem. So let's put the uh, value at an updated uh, amount. Let's put the value at an updated amount. So investments through profit and loss, you can see the outdated amount is a 6 million. Outdated amount is a 6 million and we have a fresh valuation at the bottom. Six point five million. Okay. Now we'll have to do an opening closing walk ideally over here. We'll have to do an opening closing walk over here because there are a few things which are happening during the year as well. They also speak about investment income which is of 500,000. So yep, let's do all of this. <coughs> yeah. So I'm going to come to my main sheet and do a fresh working for this now. So opening is 6 million if I'm not wrong. Closing is a 6.5. Then we may recall there were investments which were sold in the year and they had a carrying value of how much? They had a carrying value of 1.4 million. So in the year, I have assets with a carrying value of 
1.4 million which are getting sold. Yeah, and they're getting sold for 1.6. So now when you check, when you make a match, ideally, the closing value should have been 4,600, right? It should have been 4,600. But you can see that your closing value is not that. It's 6,500. So there is an increase in fair value. So gain on remeasurement. Gain on remeasurement. Okay, so this is coming up to 1,900,000. Just make a quick check. Okay. So there is some glitch, I feel like, in the question because there is no opening closing work done. However, ideally, it should have been done. So anyway, uh, they're saying that the amount over here, which is there in the trial balance that you see, the 6 million that we see over here, investments, investments. Yeah, investments over here. The 6 million that you see on 1st April 2014 is already updated uh, for at least after the sale, after the sale. So the comparison is of 6 million and 6 million. All right. Um, so sorry for the trouble, but I just hope that I'm clear now voice wise and even the screen sharing wise. Okay. We'll continue with the question. I was at the last, I believe, the working note. I was at the last working note, not last, but the second last one, the note four, where we were assessing the profit and profit on the investments. Okay. So we did the check. We did the check. And what we identified was that on the initial measurement, the year beginning value and year end value, there was a gain of 500,000. Opening is 6 million and ending is 6 million 500. So there's a gain on remeasurement of 500. So that is what I will take to my retained earnings. That's what I'm going to take to my retained earnings. So add. To link this here. Second, what other gain I have to record is if you come back to the question, if you come back to the question, they also say that investment income in the trial balance above includes the profit on the sale of investments and dividends received during the year. So, you know, when you sold this uh, investment, the cost was 1.5, 1.4, but you sold it for 1.6. The cost was 1.4, but you have made a sale for 1.6. So, clearly you can see a oh, 0.2 million gain, right? Clearly, you can see a 0.2 million gain. And then they say that the remaining is also for dividends. So I don't have to do anything, but I just have to go and check the trial balance and I have to see how much is that investment income element. Because if it's still there in the trial balance, then it's still unrecorded in my retained earnings. So I'll simply go and record in my retained earnings. Okay, so come back to your balance sheet and make a quick check. Come back to your balance sheet, not balance sheet, your trial balance, and make a quick check of how much the investment income is. It's 500. Now, out of 500, you already identified 200 is on the sale of investment, so 300 is for dividend. Whatever it is, the whole 500, the whole 500, I'm going to go and record in my retained earnings. So add dividend and sale on profit, which is another 500. Okay. So all these items I've recorded for, these are income items. So my retained earnings should increase because of it not decrease. So it's why no negative signs over here. No negative signs over here. Now, lastly, lastly, what still I have to do is, okay, you can see note five over here. There's one more note that is pending. There's one more note that is pending. Uh, and just one more check, one final check that had we put the, had we put the investment valuation in the balance sheet or not. So just make a check. Yeah, that is needed, right? This is needed. So I, if I may remember, my urine value was a 6,500,000. For safety side, I'll just go and link this up. For safety side, I'll just go and link this. So I've just linked it and it's 6,500,000. So this has also been done. Everything that I could pull from the Note 4 has been done, okay? The Note 5. Now, you all have done in this week only deferred taxation, taxation. So, you all know that a very easy stepwise approach was given to crack this. And I always tell that if single entity is tested, tax for sure comes and is for a good three to four mark. So, yeah. So, you can see already. Uh, okay, by the way, I can see two people have just joined late. It was only Abdur Rahman who was there in the meeting, Marvlin and Zoom uh, user. There's one more user who's joined late. So, I've just finished note four. I'll just repeat for you all. I'll just repeat for you all. What I have done is in the balance sheet, I have put my, 
I have put my investments at 6.5. That's what I have gone and done in the balance sheet. Second, what I have done is I have identified that at the beginning of the year, it was 6 million. And at the end of the year, it was a 6 million 500. So there is a 500,000 gain. So this is what I have recorded in my retain earnings working one. Second, what else I have recorded is that they tell me that in the trial balance, there is investments and dividend received income recorded. That if you check the trial balance, again, another 500,000 is there. So again, that another 500,000 is also what I have recorded in my retain earnings. Because they're sitting outside my retain earnings, I had gone and I have de deliberately recorded there. I'll just quickly show you all. I'll just quickly show you all what I have done. You all can see my retain earning working one. The remeasurement gained 500 and the dividend and sale uh, gain 500 from my trial balance I've pulled and I've put it here. Also in my balance sheet, my investments are now at the updated value of 6,500,000. Okay. So yeah, if you all have doubts, you all can always put in the chat box, raise hands, unmute your mic and ask. Okay. Now moving ahead, moving ahead, coming to the last adjustment here. I was just repeating that in this session, in this week, you always supposed to watch taxation, revenue, single entity. Taxation is a hot favorite adjustment of the examiner. If single entity is tested, they for sure ask. And it's a very easy mark. It's a very easy three to four mark adjustment. So what, what are we to do here? Now, a provision for current tax for the year ended 31st March 2015 of 3.5 million is required. So 3.5 million, the provision for current tax that they're asking is the most simplest thing. This is the most simplest thing and you can grab your easy marks here. This is nothing but tax expense for the year. So one impact is it goes in the PNL as an expense and the other impact is it goes in the balance sheet as a income tax payable. So I can very easily put this in my balance sheet as income tax payable in the current liabilities because I don't settle my taxes the same year. Second leg has to go in PNL, but the requirement of this question is not PNL. We are making adjustments to retain earnings. So this will go and sit in my retain earnings. Okay, it will go and sit in my retain earnings. So I'll do that without wasting time. 3.5 million tax impact, I will put it. So come to your retain earnings, less tax for the year, 3.5 million. Okay, also come to your balance sheet and in your balance sheet, come to tax payable, record a tax payable of 3.5 million. Okay, now the last leg pertaining to this note, the last leg pertaining to this note, they say that at 31st March, at 31st March, the year end, the tax base of Clarion's net assets were 12 million less than their carrying amounts. So if you compare your carrying value and tax base, they're saying there is a temporary difference of 12 million. There is a temporary difference of 12 million. The income tax rate of Clarion is at 25%, at 25%. So you all know we have cracked the steps for deferred tax. First, you find the temporary difference. Then you multiply the temporary difference with tax rate and you get the closing DTL. You put the closing detail in balance sheet, compare closing and opening, the difference has to go in PNL. So right now I already have temporary difference. I am multiplying it with the tax rate to get the closing detail, to get the closing detail, the closing deferred tax liability. So if I do a 12 into 25%, let's see how much I'm getting. And this is something straight away that will go in my balance sheet. 12 million to 25%. 3 million. I'm getting a year end liability of 3 million. This has to get compared with my opening detail. So come to your trial balance and see how much is my opening deferred tax. You can see on the credit side of 2,700,000. On the credit side, you can see your 2,700,000, which means my liability opening is 2,700,000 and year end it's 3. There is an increase of 300,000. Liability increase of 300 meaning for me, it's like a loss item. It's like an expense item. So in my profit and loss statement also, in my profit and loss statement also, it would have gotten recorded as an expense item. So over here in my draft retain earnings, my draft retain earnings, I'll just create space by putting everything, control X, control X and control V down. Okay. This is what you will have to do in the real exam if you have to create space. Select everything, control X, control V, because there's no right click option and insert line option. There is nothing of insert sort here. Okay. So let's increase in deferred tax. So that's a 300, right? If you want to show, you can show it in this manner 3000 less 2700, which is a 300 increase. So now I have pretty much done all the adjustments. 
what I would now have to do is my approach next would be to fill in the blank. Okay, to fill in the blank. So I will quickly check. <coughs> I will quickly check what was my draft retain earnings as per the question. So come to your question. Check your retain earnings figure. What is my draft retain earnings? The second line. The second line itself is my draft retain earnings figure. The un the, the non-correct version. The non-correct version is 33,100. So I'm filling the blanks. I'm putting in all the missing figures. So 33,100 is my opening draft retain earning now i'm getting to the correct retain earning so i'm doing a sum of everything and what i have is 10 800 10 million 800 and 10 000. i have a 10 million 800 and 10 000, right so this is what will go in my balance sheet there could be a mistake that we know only once we try to tally it that if there is any error we'll be able to identify at the tallying point okay so yeah now, in terms of working note 2, everything is done pretty much. Nothing missing. 3 is done. 4 is done. 5 is done. 6 is also done, right? So, from working perspective, everything is done now. Come to the face of financial and now let's add everything. Let's put the fill missing blanks here. Inventory in the balance sheet is how much? <clears throat> and trade receivables and bank. All of these three things, I'll try to look at it together. So, inventory is... 11,700 and trade receivables are 2,500. 11,700 and 2,500. Bank, if you may see, bank, if you may see, is on the credit side, which means this is not a bank debit balance. This is not like an asset. This is a bank OD. So, 1,900 will go as a OD. You're zero. But in my current liability, this is going to sit as a bank OD. 1,900, right? Yeah. Now, other blanks is what you'll try to fill. So, I have share capital missing. So, let's put the share capital 35,000. Then we have everything done as per NCL, everything done as per current liability. Trade payable is missing. So, let's fill the trade payables. It's 9,500. So, yeah. I will try to tally. If it tallies in the first shot, great. If it doesn't, then we'll try to identify if any numerical error made anywhere. So I have a 87,700. Okay, on the asset side, I have a 87,700. On the liability side, I have a perfect 87,700, the same figure. So it doesn't look like that we have gone wrong anywhere. Mostly we have not gone wrong anywhere. Is why we will have a tallied balance sheet. Just in case in the exam your balance sheet doesn't tally, you will just try to give it two to three minutes look and identify where the mistake is. If you're still not able to identify, forget it. Those mark that's something where you have lost mark because of a difficult adjustment and you have not passed the impact for a difficult adjustment correctly. It's okay. Even if you invest your next 15 minutes, maybe you still wouldn't get it. And there are probably maximum two to three marks lying there. Why are you wasting so much time for your two to three marks? If it's not telling, just invest two to three more minutes more maximum and leave it. Go to the next 20 mark sum, which is a ratio sum, where there is potential to grab so many marks. What is the worst thing that you can do to yourself is you'll stick to the single entity sum balance sheet. You'll try to tally it, try to tally it. You'll come to the end of the exam and you'll leave the ratio sum completely. For what? For just to get that two to three marks more. And then you will fail with a 47, 48, 49 mark. There, if you would find ratios, basis own figure rules, there was so much scope to score so much marks and ratios. So this is the mistake that we are not to do in the exam. Okay. So this is one more question, Clarion, that has been added to your bank for practice sake. There are three pre-recorded questions on single entity, which is already up on the portal, which you all can practice. Okay. This is the fourth question that has been added. Now, next week, we will continue our practice. And next week, I, I think there's a class on Friday. Yes, of course. So we're going to drill uh, interpretation of financial statements in the live class. There's one uh, recorded uh, question done for you all with explanation of ratios, everything. First is introduction, explanation, and then uh, recorded on ratios. But uh, after that, there is a live session that I'm going to take on ratios. So again, in the live session, we'll drill more questions. And I am mostly going to take one more extra class next week. Okay. That's either a Saturday or Sunday. I'll, I'll give you all a heads up. I'll inform you all whether it's a Saturday or a Sunday. But I want to do one more session of live practice with you all. I might take more ratio questions or I might take consolidation questions. Okay. Now, already four single entity questions are done with you all pre-recorded. 
today and three pre-recorded earlier. Now, I want to know from you all what more life practice you all need for. Do you all need for consolidation or for single entity? Put it in the chat box. If you all have preference, I'll choose that. Else, basis my analysis, I'll do. If you all have a preference, please put it in the chat box. I'll drill that more in the live session. Else, I'll do it basis my analysis. Any specific topic that you all are finding difficult? Consolidation or single entity? Okay. So, I have single entity coming up. So, fine then. Um, great. No problem. That's absolutely no problem. Four questions till now. You all already have few more questions I'll drill in the next live session. At least on the minimum side, I would want to drill two. And I think if we are fast, if you all have already gone through these four questions, then I'll be able to take that class at a faster speed. Yeah. So I'll be able to finish three questions then. I'll be able to finish three questions. Okay. So yeah, we'll do single entity drilling. Don't worry. So I'll end the session for today. I'll end the session for today because uh, I will not be able to crack a, a full length question in the next half an hour. Right. So we'll end the session for today. See you all in the next week, okay? Please finish the uh, to-dos for the coming week. Be on track. Um, try to complete as, as much study hub questions as you all can and your section C timely questions which are being given as assignments and practice, okay? That's it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. The interpretation cannot be accessed, okay? Uh, 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 interpretation was that the already due for you all i don't think interpretation is already due for you all right it was the update uh the as per planner it's not supposed to be up already is why maybe you're not able to access just let me quickly check the planner if as per planner it should be up then i'll quickly report the it team and they'll make sure it's up, up there yes thanks i will thanks Supura. thanks everyone